Hi, this is Charles Hoskinson broadcasting live from warm, sunny Colorado. Always warm, always sunny. Sometimes Colorado. It's a new year, January 2nd, 2022. And it, uh, it's going to be a fun year. There's going to be a lot of things that happen, a lot of things to learn, a lot of things to do, a lot of things to build. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned, we're going to change the podcast format gradually over time, uh, build a studio downstairs, and uh, we're going to have a lot of fun with that. But uh, the other thing is we're going to do a lot more pedagogy, a lot more education, a lot more teaching. Um, some will be done by me. Some will be done by Lars and others. Uh, but uh, to start the new year off on Sunday, I figured it'd be a lot of fun to do a whiteboard video and talk about dApps, talk about DeFi, talk about development. Uh, but first, I actually got some new books in. So some of you know, I'm trying to build a nice meditation practice and I... Uh, looked at John Kabat-Zinn's recommended reading, and he recommended about 30 books. So this is some of the 30 books that are trickling in as Amazon ships them to me. So Why Meditate from uh, Matthew Ricard. For those of you who know him, he's a French monk who's uh, eponymously known as the happiest man alive. And if you're a Chan master, Hoofprint of the Ox. This is an uh, oldie but a goodie. And then Zen books always have the best names. So this one's from Elizabeth Hamilton. Untrain your parrot and other no-nonsense introductions to the path of Zen. Ah, there we go. So just a little side thing. Okay, let's go ahead and get to it, shall we? Got my coffee. This is going to be a long one. This is going to be a fun one. Put on your hats. Put on your boots. Get strapped in. We're going to have some fun. Uh, Okay, so first thing we're going to do, share screen and screen share. Boom. Wah! There we go. All right, so uh, if you're really starting to dig in and gain a better understanding of Cardano, the development experience, uh, what I'd recommend is starting with the introduction docscardano.org. So it's up here. You guys can see it on the screen. And basically, it covers a whole area about Plutus, Rosetta, other components like native tokens and so forth. And you can learn about Plutus, understand the extended UTXO model, about the ledger model, how Plutus works, the scripts work, uh, and so forth. If you want a deeper introduction into Plutus, there's a paper wrote a little while ago with uh, James Gabby and Lars Brunius. And it's the UTXO versus account-based smart contract blockchain paradigms. So basically, it compares and contrasts what people are used to in the Ethereum world versus what people are doing now in the Cardano world with extended UTXO. And I'll read off the abstract, just give you guys an idea and the conclusion. Uh, we implement two versions of a simple but illustrative smart contract, one in Solidity on the Ethereum blockchain platform and one in Plutus on the Cardano platform with annotated code excerpts and source code attached. We get a clearer view of the Cardano programming model in particular by introducing a novel mathematical abstraction we call the idealized extended UTXO. For each version of the contract, we trace how the architecture of the underlying platforms and their mathematical effects, the natural programming styles and natural classes of errors. We prove some simple but novel results about alpha conversion and observational equivalence for Cardano and explain why Ethereum does not have them. We conclude with wide ranging and detailed discussion in the light of examples, mathematical model and mathematical results so far. So uh, really, when you go down to the conclusion of this paper, and this was written before we launched Alonzo, so there's even more to it. Basically, what the conclusion is getting at is here. Uh, we hope this paper will provide a precise yet accessible entry point for interested readers and a useful guide to some of the design considerations in the area. We have seen that Ethereum is an accounts-based blockchain system, whereas Cardano, like Bitcoin, is UTXO-based. And we have implemented a, specific, a specification in Solidity and in Plutus. And we have given a mathematical abstraction of Cardano, idealized extended UTXO, that raised some, some surprisingly non-trivial points, both quite, both quite mathematical and more implementational, uh, which are discussed in the body of the paper. The accounts-based paradigm itself lends to imperative programming style. A smart contract is a program that manipulates a global state, mapping global inputs, accounts to values. The UTXO-based paradigm lends itself to a functional programming style. 
The smart contract is a function that takes a UTXO list as an input and returns a UTXO list as an output with no other dependencies. This is the heart of the matter. Okay. So I am not a dogmatic person. I believe that you need to have a multi paradigm world. Uh, and so a multi paradigm world means that you have to blend both functional and imperative styles if you're going to do useful things. There are many cases for subsets of applications and expressions where a functional only style could work. But in practice, you'll find that there are certain things that may be easier to do in an imperative style. And so really from the very beginning, there was a question of expressiveness and model. So let's talk about that to start with. So expressiveness is one of those properties. So when you look at things like Bitcoin, Bitcoin script is kind of the foundational model of our industry because that's where we started in 2009. And that does have that functional-esque, functional-like experience. It's kind of a stack-based assembly. It's based on a language called fourth uh, and basically you have this UTXO model. So you have inputs and you have outputs. And those inputs and outputs basically are operated on by some sort of function. And that has a whole bunch of terms and conditions that are defined by the scripting language. And there's a big limitation to the level of expressiveness that you have. Okay. So then when you go all the way to the other side, you have things like the Java virtual machine, um, the common language runtime, et cetera, et cetera. So these are full program environments. you have maximal expressiveness here. You can run full applications. Like for example, on the JVM, you have Minecraft, okay? Lots of things are built in C-sharp. You guys are quite familiar with that. So then you have things like the EVM and they say, okay, we need to restrict some things because, well, if we don't and we have maximal expressiveness, this is too open and thus we have security issues. All right. So then you look at, well, where do we put UTXO on this list? So Bitcoin script is kind of here. And then there's a question mark of where do you draw the line? You could certainly replicate what EVM is doing. Well, you can do it here, here. So one of the first parts of the research agenda when we were looking at taking the UTXO model, because we really like this functional idea, and we'll talk a bit about the value proposition of it. We say, well, let's, let's make it a little bit more extensible. So we wrote the extended UTXO model. And really what we did is we said, okay, we think that for a large class of applications, the sweet spot will be somewhere in the middle between what you can do on these big things what you can do with Bitcoin, the most valuable cryptocurrency in the world and most used at the moment, and what the EVM is doing. Because the question is, this space between these two, is it really needed? Are these features and functionality that are creating a larger, more open attack surface really required for DeFi? Are they really required for oracles? Are they really required for stable coins? Are they really required for your NFTs? Are they really required for any of these dApps that we see in the industry? Because if they're not required, you're not using this, but you're paying for it. And you're paying for it in very particular ways. First off, this imperative model that the EVM is using is very hard to scale in practice. The introduction of a global state is one of the reasons, um, but there are others. So that's one cost. Another cost is that there are many things you can do, and just because you're not doing them doesn't mean an attacker, an adversary, can't exploit that. 
So you have to be very careful with your expressiveness. This is one of the reasons why the Bitcoin crowd stay here. They've created over a trillion dollars of value with their use cases. And they say, guys, the more that we push it this direction, yes, we gain some more programmability, more expressiveness, more potential for value. But then that openness also creates some issues for us. So what 2022 is effectively about as we build a DeFi ADAP ecosystem for Cardano is really asking what is required for these in this new model. And it turns out that if there are other things that are needed to start replicating and emulating that, well, then you could write SIPs, Cardano improvement proposals, and there's already three that have been written in direct collaboration with the DeFi vendors to do this. Increase the expressiveness, thus allowing more things. Okay. And that's really what the next six to nine months are about as we build out this DeFi ecosystem together as a community is getting that sweet spot of expressiveness because extended UTXO is a completely new model. No one's ever done it before. We've done UTXO. We invented extended UTXO. Ergo was first to market with this concept. And they've already given a lot of great advice and clarity. So we said, wow, that's uh, that's something to learn. And as they grow, we grow. We're kind of learning where that sweet spot needs to be. Now, if we preserve that functional style, then and locality, so local state, instead of this concept of a global state to be manipulated, then what's nice about it is that you also get a lot of security. Why? Well, because this is really kind of a mathematical object that is very easy to model. It's very easy to understand your preconditions and your post conditions and your invariants. It's very easy to use property based testing. Furthermore, it's very easy to write specifications. And if you can write specifications, you can do property based testing, you can do design by contract, you can do all kinds of great things, then you can start doing verification against those specifications. And those verifications allow you to certify software against standards. What does that mean? It means that you can get a high assurance that the smart contract as implemented is correct. Okay. Now, you can do this in the imperative sense. Uh, people do it all the time. It's very expensive and it's very time consuming. How you write your code, how you design your program, how inputs and outputs are handled, uh, the purity of the functions of the system, the amount of side effects a system has, the amount of uh, things a system can do leads to a combinatorial explosion of possibilities. And that explosion of possibilities tells you basically the bounds of how expensive it's going to be to get high assurance that your software is correctly written. This is one of the core reasons why we chose, instead of starting with an accounts-based model on this side and dialing it back, like what Ethereum did, to start with a functional UTXO model and dial it forward. When you dial things back, you're taking away, when you dial things forward, you're gradually adding and you add based on a need. And each of those needs you can think deeply about in the context of preserving features that you care about. For example, like deterministic cost. Deterministic cost is saying when you build your smart contract, what you think it's going to cost is actually what it ends up costing. It's a concept of local state versus global where things change in unpredictable ways. Every good programmer knows the more that you can keep in a deterministic world, 
and not move into a non-deterministic world, the better, uh, because it gives you a lot more certainty about predictability of behavior for a contract, okay? The other th reason why we chose to start here and then dial it forward instead of starting here and dialing it back is because as you're scaling up expressiveness, you also can model performance very easily. And we have, with Bitcoin, information since 2009, 13 years ago. Think about that. 13 years of history here that we can draw from in that particular model and understand how do we make the model more performant. So let's talk about that. So first off, when we look at blocks, because that's what a blockchain system does, They're like a heartbeat. So you have a time between blocks to make them. And this is where the transactions happen. And this is where they get aggregated. So the most obvious way to scale is to just start with the blocks and make them bigger. And we're actually doing that. So with node 1.3.3, we're going to restart the block agenda that we started last year. And I think we increased it by about 12.5% last year. So the blocks will get bigger. And this is part of a larger optimization program. Okay. That's led by an interdisciplinary team, an intercompany team, uh, everything from library optimization. Uh, and that's led by Galwa, their uh, military contractor. Uh, to things like improving a lot of the efficiencies inside the core node software and the network stack. And each time that's done, the blocks can get bigger. Bigger blocks, more TX can fit inside the blocks. Okay. And that's a continuous process. So, for example, this is about mid January. And once that happens, blocks start getting bigger. Okay. And that'll just keep going until we reach a kind of a maximum threshold that's really determined by propagation. So we want within five seconds, 95% of the peers to have received the block. That's the empirical measure that we're using. So you look at the one second, three second, five second propagation time and then you just can keep increasing the block until you get there. And there's tons of things that can do to optimize that. Data structures that could be put in to optimize that. There's a lot of coding theory that can also be used for this. So for example, you'll hear terms like fountain codes. Okay, and that's being used in various places in the industry. There's some great research out of Arizona State University that was done by the Dash community. And they talked about that. Um, there's also great papers being produced out of Stanford, and that's uh, out of David Chi's lab. And uh, David uh, is a professor there, and he's studying the co-development of proof of stake and the network stack, and he recently published a great paper. Okay, so that's one thing to do. Prove your propagation rate, optimize, and then you can expand the blocks. So that gets you somewhere. Second, when you look at the block cost, it looks like this, kind of like a heartbeat. So this is dead space. This is dead time. So if I am a processing node that's actually processing the blocks, these blocks here, then I have situation where I'm not doing anything in this area, and I'm doing a lot of stuff here. Oh, no. And then nothing here. Oh no, uh, not a lot there. Well, pipelining is basically about saying, hey, how do we be smarter about that with pipelining? And we do stuff during that dead space. That effectively allows you to increase the throughput of the system even more.
Okay. So that's what we're doing in tandem with the block size increase. So both are happening. We're optimizing libraries, making things work faster. We're optimizing the core node, reducing syncing time and these types of things, optimizing the network stack so our propagation window is better. So we can get 95% broadcast within five seconds, despite the fact the blocks are getting bigger. And then you can give the people who process things more work to do during the dead time. To simplify the concept of pipelining. Okay, that's a simple optimization. And that's also underway by the core team. So this is happening in parallel to the pipelining effort. Then there's this question of, well, wait a minute, why don't I do blocks in parallel? This is something that we designed with Ouroboros since the very beginning. We really wanted to do this. I even mentioned it in my 2017 whiteboard video. So you'll see a lot of people talk about DAG protocols. And usually they break down to this concept of uh, key blocks and input blocks or something like that. So what happens is that you have these heartbeats and those heartbeats are relatively aligned and synchronized. Maybe they're 20 seconds or they're 30 seconds. And then in the meantime, you, you have some sort of intermediate process where lots of micro blocks are being constructed and they're put in a different type of data structure. And then somehow they're serialized and represented inside those heartbeats, those key blocks. So we wrote a paper called Parallel Chains back in 2018 that kind of explained this concept. We also came up with a concept called Input Endorsers back in 2016 with the original Ouroboros paper. So we've been thinking about this concept for quite some time, as has the industry. So when you see these types of things, you'll see things like Tangle with IOTA. You'll see different notions of consensus, like the metastable consensus that uh, Avalanche is doing. Uh, and everybody has some concept of how do we do more between the heartbeats? You'll see sharding protocols that come, like, for example, poly shard. That was promote Viswanath's work, and Ethereum 2 is pursuing this as well. So this is really the holy grail, if you can achieve it, with a caveat, two of them. One, that you're constrained by network throughput. So you can basically ratchet up your TPS as high as you want to go in these types of models. You can be a million TPS if you really want to, as long as you're able to broadcast that and people are able to keep up with that. So going back up, there's this issue of propagation. Can you propagate what you need to propagate in those windows to maintain the security assumptions of the protocols? Okay. And it's also a data representation question as well. So data representation is basically what are the people in the network validating? And maybe you move to a heterogeneous model where the people processing the blocks have a different view than the rest of the network. Yet there's still inclusive accountability through some sort of structure. And we're examining these types of things, for example, with Mithril, where you have a small part of your chain and you can always verify things, uh, but then other actors have different views. So if you do that, you may be able to ratchet TPS up a lot. The other issue is optimism. And I'm not talking about the think positive thoughts. I'm thinking about the belief and reality of network conditions. All DAG protocols and all protocols that attempt to do this idea of input blocks between the heartbeats have to have some degree of optimism that people are honest. You will see a litany of attacks uh, in literature of the last five years in particular, where when people are not honest in the way that they construct these things and you have conflicting transactions and blocks and 
when the serialization step occurs, things get put back together, performance tends to degrade considerably. This is why you'll see in a lot of these protocols, this concept of slashing, concept of fraud proofs. You'll see this concept of bonds, these other economic mechanisms, because ultimately you want to keep people honest. You want to create some notion of punishment, because if you don't, those input blocks will sometimes have an attacker come through and they'll be able to damage the network performance, not permanently, but for a period of time. And in some cases, the performance will be less than a single shard protocol. So you actually gain nothing when you do this. This is why we thought so hard about the theory with parallel chains and input endorsers. And it's why we thought so carefully about the co-evolution of the proof of stake protocol with the network stack, because we really wanted to understand how all these pieces fit together. And we started building some more sophisticated primitives for inclusive accountability. We don't necessarily need to implement these things with Ouroboros. In fact, it may be counterproductive. At the moment, there are no punitive measures uh, that we had to put in that require people to bond or slash or produce fraud, fraud proofs or so forth. But they always could be added in to further accelerate the system. So the question is, where do these things take you? Uh, realistically speaking, if you look at real network conditions in a Byzantine network, you probably can use this with pipelining to get yourself to about 500 to 1,000 TPS with a mixture of scripts plus regular transactions, you know, value transactions, let's call them, okay? That's really where you can go. And then as you evolve the network stack and figure out more clever ways of propagating better data representations, that window can increase over time. And then you perhaps can put in some punitive measures to further optimize things, especially if you wish to more deeply shard. Now, you can increase this even more if you want to, but the safety of the system decreases and almost always your centralization increases to a point where occasionally you even have to reset your network. And I don't think that's a real cryptocurrency, but some people in the industry disagree and that's fine. People will make decisions accordingly. Okay, so... Where are we at with this? Well, some blog posts are coming. We have the scientific design done. We understand the design space incredibly well. And after pipelining, input endorsers will be the number one topic uh, to implement. I want both pipelining, input endorsers, and an aggressive optimization agenda done this year. October is our deadline. Because there are three hard forks, one in February, one in June, one in October. I want these things done this year. Don't really care the cost. Don't really care who has to be hired. Uh, don't care if it's internal, external. Uh, it could be millions, could be tens of millions of dollars. It doesn't fucking matter. It needs to get done. We have the science done. We did the hard work of writing the papers. And this is achievable engineering. It should be done. It can be done. It will be done. We will find a way because it's important. Uh, you know, as we dial up the expressiveness of the system, what's going to happen is more use and utility is going to come. And this is really going to take us to millions, to billions of users. There already are millions of users. So when we go to tens and then hundreds and then eventually the billions, the system has to be able to handle that capacity. There are a lot of people. We're in the number one developed cryptocurrency in the world in terms of GitHub commits. Um, there are a lot of people who wake up every day, almost 15 companies now that are working on this. In many cases, in parallel. There is no academic process in this engineering in that we have to publish a paper and wait for peer review. Those have already been published. Okay, there's almost 130 of them at this point, more to come. That's over. It's now specification, it's now engineering, and so it's a coding problem. 
and that is much easier to solve than original novel science. Uh, so uh, this is where we're at for those. Now, there's more to say about this. In particular, all of these things is uh, the concept of on-chain, but the whole reason you do extended UTXO is that it, because of that locality and determinism, it makes it significantly easier to do things off-chain. And there are three mechanisms to do that that I'll talk about today. Okay, so first off, there's Hydra. And this is just that good old-fashioned payment and state channel idea. There's a great team here. They're making phenomenal process, uh, progress. There's already a Hydra node on the test net. We're playing around with it, doing things with it. Very important. And what's going to happen is you're going to just see these blips where they do more and more and more through releases throughout the year. And not much needs to be said there. It's a rapid development process, and that team really wants to see that go. And the SPOs are a very natural, organic set of people to operate and run Hydra. Lightning really paved the way. The problem with Lightning is that they don't have the E. They're not expressive enough, so it's exceedingly difficult in practice to get Lightning working with the promises that have been made, which is why it's taken so many years for these vendors to do that. Because we're more expressive with the E, means we can do this faster and better. And we're making great progress on it. So that's one dimension. Just get transactions into a different layer two network, process them there. They're nearly fee-less, extremely cheap. And there's a lot of load balancing that can be done. And there's thousands of stake pools that can receive that and run channels. And they're going to be more and more involved with this as we move quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four. And I told the team I really want to see some form of 1.0 Hydra running on mainnet before the end of the year. October is a big month for us. So they're working hard at this. And we will continue adding resources as a project to make sure that something comes out here. Because there's so much low-hanging fruit for microtransactions and payments. And there's a lot of smart contract stuff that can be done in these subnets that I think uh, would reduce bloat on chain. Second, you can do off-chain computing, off-chain Okay, and that's what's already happening. Sunday is doing it. Uh, other people are doing it. Uh, there's a, something called Eigenlayer. Uh, there's dozens of projects that are figuring out ways to offload computation. Uh, there's a really cool paper, just to give you an idea of, of this, um, called ACE. It stands for Asynchronous Contract Execution, and it was written out of ETH Zurich. Very nice university. Einstein went there. And basically, asynchronous contract execution is about how do you designate people off-chain to do some computing uh, and then return it, and you're able to prove that the computing was done correctly uh, given some sort of M of N trust assumption. So this area is going to become long-term, I think, one of the largest areas of research and thought. and create marketplaces for off-chain computing. Uh, because Hydra is a very specific case and a very specific design, and it has a design surface for microtransactions and specific contract patterns. Here, it's a more general design, and the design surface is much more about picking a group of people that you trust, M of N. Uh, and uh, there are many different approaches, and these map incredibly well to the delegated SPO model because again, they can be a service provider to do these types of things. And these map incredibly well to the UTXO model because this is local, it's deterministic, it's significantly easier to build the proofs necessary and verify the computation was done correctly with or without the network there. You don't require global state or synchronization. Finally, sidechains. Okay, now, we have a huge advantage with Ouroboros. What Ouroboros does is it builds a very strong root of trust. You end up getting thousands of 
in this case, 3,000 SPOs, and that's just only going to increase. And once you have that, what you can do is sort them. It's called cryptographic sortition. Pick a subset, and we'll call that, uh, I don't know, S subset of the SPOs. And then what you can do is bootstrap a side chain. And this is rotating. So you'll have a different subset every epoch. You can bootstrap a side chain that's fast, really fast, because you can use high performance BFT protocols. Okay, this is what uh, like Harmony One with Rapid Chain or any of these guys that are in the BFT space, like Algorand or so forth. There are advantages because you get fast finality and you get high performance. And it's something the EOS community even tried to chase, um, but they didn't really have the theoretical underpinning because you, you have to start with a, a strong root of trust first. Then you use that to create a subset. You use the subset then to create a sidechain. They did things in a very odd way. So this is the Ouroboros main chain. And then we have these sidechains, like the Yella sidechain, like Catalyst like the EVM, you know, these types of things, okay? And each of those chains can run protocols that are highly optimized and extremely fast and with a large amount of throughput. So you potentially get thousands of TPS because you have a permissioned BFT protocol where the permissioning is coming from the main chain. So it's still decentralized actually, but it behaves like a permissioned protocol. And because you have a you know well-known fixed quorum you can optimize the hell out of the network stack which means that you have much better propagation if you have high performance protocols that also have high amounts of optimization with the network stack you can achieve high throughput very high throughput and this is really what we were talking about in 2016 when i wrote the cardano white paper and i was talking about the difference between the settlement layer and the computation layers. By the way, you'd also see Cardano AD. I called it application domain. That's what I was talking about here. So if you read the original white paper, that was the Cardano AD. The computation layers, you can have many of them, and they are just subsets of the SPOs. So you can have S1 here, and S2 here, and S3 here. Easy to select them as needed, okay? This allows you to have a very vibrant, beautiful ecosystem of chains. And it's all backed by very strong theory and very strong engineering and practice. And this is actually the direction that Ethereum 2 is chasing with their whole Oracle chain idea and these sharded chains. They're effectively doing that. They're creating a strong root of trust at the base, leveraging that root of trust then to create high performance BFT chains. We support that. And we wrote a protocol specifically for this, two of them. The Ouroboros BFT protocol can be highly optimized. The other thing is we wrote proof of stake sidechains. That was Peter Gaggi. Back in 2018. And this, I think, was 2018, 2019. Okay? So those weren't just papers, 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 papers. Those are real things, and they have real consequences. Uh, for this system and they mapped out the entire theory so I, we can speak with certainty about things because we're not just talking out of our ass we wrote papers they went through the peer review process they were challenged people who don't work for us who are independent in the academic community looked at these things with decades of experience and said there's novelty there and then we actually implemented these things we implemented obft in the byron reboot okay And if you look at the Mamba project, we re-implemented Ouroboros BFT for the Scala EVM code that we inherited from our work on the ETC project. Long legacy there, many years of effort. You guys can see the incredible performance that these chains have as we ratchet up the complexity. Okay? This is something that is in scope for 2022. This is in scope for 2022. 
and through partners, we're going to see what we can do with Eigenlayer and these other ideas. And this would be something very magical for the community to pick up that middle part. But that's something that will continue throughout the years because it's so valuable. And it is not a clear distinction. The things in Hydra connect to that. The things in the side chains connect to this. They're all kind of together. So this is the off-chain concept. Now, you'll see that we're putting together many micro workshops, summits for specific things. Like, for example, DEXs. Every single DEX is building something like this in their own way for these workshops. Bring them together, have them talk to each other so we can all learn together and we can look at some patterns and the same concept with the Cardano DeFi Alliance. As we do these workshops, we're going to learn a lot. Some of the things that the workshops are going to request are for us to ratchet up the expressiveness of the system. So new SIPs will come. There are already three SIPs, as I mentioned, slated for June that add things like read-only UTXO and so forth, and they're going to come in to help with that. Those new cryptographic primitives, new technologies, and other things will enable us to have more efficient off-chain computing and also improve the trust model so that it gets more and more decentralized very rapidly. This is a high priority. On a quarterly basis, a lot of people are going to be meeting and the DeFi Alliance, we're going to make sure we meet with them on a regular basis and there's going to be a lot of communication and it's kind of like a spiral. It's frustrating at first because there's a lot to do and there's actually a lot of places to aggregate. So if you look at, for example, here, there's a stack exchange to ask questions. There's also a great developer Discord right here that has over 11,000 members in the developer Discord. And that's only going to continue to grow. Okay, so it's a very big, very nice community. A lot of stuff going on and heavy investments will be continuously made this year by us, the foundation, Emergo, DC Spark, the dApps in the ecosystem. And if you are a community member asking, what can I do? If you should demand that the people building on Cardano contribute to alliances, contribute to the documentation, attend workshops, open source their code at some arbitrary point and share ideas, and also work with everybody on how we can build out that middle. Okay. Now, there are some other things to do, like, for example, the things that go into the blocks themselves can be optimized. So things like script compression, for example, that's coming as well. We are originally going to put it in with the original Lonzo hard fork, but the Haskell libraries were not efficient enough. So we paid Galois and they came in and they worked and improved that by a considerable margin. So that's going to be coming in February. Batching. Rollups. These types of optimization. So the things that physically go in the blocks can be optimized as well. So that's in scope. People are working on these types of things. Ideas are being proposed and discussed. Pipelining can always be improved. There's always a process to amortize computation. Doing that with the epic boundary blocks, for example, with 1.3.3, uh, and more can be done. And the first generation of these input endorsers will be quite efficient, but there's a lot of room there to continue to improve that. The same for network optimizations. That's happening. Then the things that happen off-chain, you have three clear paths that are going to continue to optimize and get better. Hydra alone for the microtransaction world can move us into the millions of transactions per second. These kinds of things are going to be built just as much by the DAP ecosystem as they are by the core custodians of the project. And sidechains is an endless river because you can, you're only constrained by the hardware of the SPOs. The more sidechains, the more profit they make, the better the hardware they get. This is a very scalable model, okay? So let's then talk about developer experience. That matters a lot. Okay, it's a lot to ask to go into this world of functional programming. It's happening more and more because of multi-threading and the need for quality. But you need some imperative programming. I started this by saying, 
hey, I believe in a multi-model world, okay? And that's why we have the side chains. There's already people like DC Spark, for example, who have an EVM side chain that they've created. Today, you can use it, play around with it, do stuff on it, deploy applications on it. So if you live in this world and you want to use the Ethereum tooling, you have a path to do that better, faster, and cheaper than pretty much any other blockchain, or at least comparable with the third generations that are barking around on market. This functional programming model is new. Functional program itself is very old, but extended UTXO, it's new. And this is hard for the moment. And how we make it easier is we make it easier together. We work with the alliances, we work with each other, and we use the CIP process, and we divide and conquer. And we decide, how do we write things? For example, the PAB. People keep asking, when PAB? It's the stupidest fucking question in the world. It's like asking, when JVM? <laughs> Guys, it's here, and it has many components to it. And so really, it's a question of, okay, which part of the PAB do you need for your application? And in some cases, those parts are already built. In other cases, they're still under development. But some people can already use it. Some people aren't using it at all in deploying applications. Furthermore, PAB diversity is coming. We're likely going to take components of the PAB and rewrite those components in TypeScript. So they're JavaScript native. And write lots of bindings make it very easy for people to use this in a web setting and orientation. We're building a light wallet ourselves. It may, it's very important that these things work in the browser. We've already successfully compiled parts of the PAB with GHCJS into JavaScript. So you can already use those parts. So it's not when PAB, it's what part of the PAB do you need? And over time, that grows and grows and grows using utility. But there's going to be many conversations about this. So the dev experience is a connection of tutorials, standard development kits, video content, explaining how to do things, things like documentation, good interfaces. Okay tooling, and so forth. There's more and more and more and more. But really, all of these things come from communication and cooperation. Now, we understand that it is a competitive disadvantage to say, well, we have to spend 12 months or whatever working together to improve the experience for this particular model that has huge advantages from scale to quality. Okay. And that's completely fair, which is why we have that side chain model, which is why we support the EVM. Which, and so if you want to build now, go talk to DC Spark, become a partner of theirs and start building there. Start testing things on the Mamba side chains, which are imminent for the betas and start building there. And what you're using is Solidity. What you're using is Ethereum tooling, which is quite mature at this point, has years of history behind it and so forth. Okay, so if there's an immediate commercial need, this is the way to go. And you accept all of the trade-offs that the Ethereum ecosystem has. If you wanna be a pioneer, which is why we call it Plutus Pioneer, and you wanna pioneer a completely new model that long-term has enormous advantages from our ability to do things off-chain with Hydra and off-chain technologies and deploy side chains. It has enormous advantages in our ability to verify things and make sure that they're correct so you don't run into and be one of those $10.5 billion of hacked DeFi that keeps hacking again and again and again. And also deterministic cost. And by the way, you're going to probably long-term end up being the cheapest programming model in terms of operating cost. Then you can be a pioneer here and you can work with us, the DeFi Alliance, the DAP outreach programs. And there's a lot of people, 11,000 people in the Discord who are there. There's a stack exchange. It's 
a challenge. It's hard, but you know, developing for the iPhone when it first came out was hard. Developing for Android devices when it first came out was hard. It didn't invalidate the model or say these models are broken or bad. It just said you have to be patient with the 1.0. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot to do. And to the rest of the industry, especially the Bitcoin maximalists, guys, if you are ever going to have smart contracts, this is the way. You should be looking at Cardano as the beta test for Bitcoin. You're welcome. You know, but they're so self-righteous and they're so stuck up their own asses and you know, they think everything is just their world. They're blind to the fact that the only way to make Bitcoin truly support smart contracts is either to outsource it to some other layer of the system, in which case you've completely escaped the entire trust model that Bitcoin is built on, or extend Bitcoin to have extended UTXO. So every single thing we're doing here, these development patterns, these kits, these canonical ways of doing things, these interfaces, all of these things basically are trailblazing a model, just like Bitcoin trailblazed a model for us uh, for doing that. And if you want to be a participant in something like that, that's very exciting. You'll learn a lot, a lot to build. It's, it's a very fertile time. And you'll get a great network effect. And long-term, the advantages are clear. You'll be able to scale to high throughput. You're going to be building on bedrock, on granite. And the things that you build will last a long time. You're impatient. There is, are other options available to you. And those options will become more and more attractive month after month and are always there. And then what will happen is a polyglot model where in the future, applications will use both. They'll use stuff in the functional realm, stuff in the imperative world. They'll use stuff on-chain, on-chain, and off-chain, okay? On-chain, on-chain, and off-chain. What the hell do I mean by two on-chains? Well, this is Cardano plus its side-chains. But then on-chain could also be another network like Ethereum. It could be Bitcoin itself. Be anything and then obviously all the off-chain stuff we've talked about okay so a dap will end up looking like this all of these things together that's the future so why are we fighting each other the things here could bring a just as much economic value and the things here could bring just as much economic value and if you're an spo you could be routing all these things and making money from all these things so why in god's name are we maximalists we're all good for each other Lots of wrapped Bitcoin on Ethereum right now. Think about it. Think it through. Really, really, you know, kind of put that out there and ask yourself, what are we doing? Okay. So I hope this tutorial gives you guys a more concrete understanding of the ecosystem. There's a, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of thought here. There's a lot of moving pieces here. And this was not just some, well, we'll just talk about it for a while. Th there are 600 people at just my company. And well over 100 of those 600 people are engineers specifically devoted just to this stuff. And then, as I mentioned, there's more than a dozen companies doing stuff in this stack. Everything from formal verification to building pieces of infrastructure and we're getting to a point where if it's a matter of cutting a check, we'll cut the check to accelerate things because there are certain things that really do need to be in the stack. And I want them there. We want them there. And it's not an academic concern. We did the research. They delivered the researchers. Uh, and the theory is clear. We understand this model works. We understand how it works. And we know why this model is going to grow. The community continues to grow. The community continues to be solid and stable and capable. Uh, and there's so many areas for optimization. There's so many areas for collaboration. There's so many areas for the DAP and DeFi ecosystem to contribute back and help grow and evolve the system. And we're doing that together. Every indication we have from the conversations we've had last six months the overwhelming majority of people 
are patient, systematic, and excited about being pioneers and building out this new model. And those who aren't, they have options. Okay, you can't be everything to everyone. But at the end of the day, this is the model we're going for. On chain, on chain, off chain. And it's going to happen one way or another. And we have science on our side. We have design principles that have come from decades of hard work. We have legacy that connects to academics, some of which are in their 60s, who witnessed this stuff back in the 70s. And they're kind of walking through with us. So this is it. We're getting it done. You know, this is the DAP and DeFi model. I hope it really gives you guys a little bit of clarity and a little bit of better understanding about why we did things the way we did things. And, you know, it's always easy to start with high expressiveness and centralization. It's a lot harder to start with low expressiveness and high decentralization and then gradually ratchet up the expressiveness. It takes longer. There's a lot more to do. There's a lot more debates uh, because you're really drilling into very specific details. But when you do this, you preserve the most important thing, which is censorship resistance and decentralization, or else why the fuck are we even doing this as an industry? Why aren't we just all on Amazon Web Services if you don't care about these properties? We are achieved nothing as an industry if we have don't have decentralization. And then in terms of expressiveness, if you start to open, you get $10.5 billion of screw-ups in one year. How much is going to be in this year? And at what point do we as an industry say enough? And what will have to happen is we'll have to dial things back. And you think we're slow? Can you imagine how hard it is to verify a massive piece of Solidity code? How much time and effort and money has to be spent and do that for a massive ecosystem? Or maybe you can just do it right the first time and do it right with great principles. And then everybody is following each other. And then the ecosystem as a whole is much better. I'm not saying there are going to be no hacks. I'm not saying the software is always going to be perfect and everything's right. But I'm saying it's a game of averages. And when you look at those averages, you have to ask, are we as a whole doing pretty good? Or are we as a whole doing pretty bad? And let's be honest here. The industry as a whole is doing pretty bad. And we're getting away with it as an industry because some people are getting rich and those people control the media. And those people seem to just want to push people's hopes and dreams about making other people rich when the vast majority of people are going to lose everything. That is the reality. It's the cold, harsh, austere truth. And if it's not, then you fucking tell me why decentralization is not the number one concern. You tell me that. You can't. You just can't. When you actually look at these third generation protocols and what they prioritized and how they do their marketing, they keep telling you upfront how performant they are. And they never really talk about control, the evolution of the protocol, safety, consumer protections. They never really talk about how these things are interoperable and fit in the legacy system as much as they do the non-legacy system because they just want your money. They just want to win. They just want the developer. And they say, well, you know, after we have the network effect, we'll just fix it all. But here's the problem. If you're truly decentralized, you can't because you have to get the consent of all the people that you've just onboarded. And if those people don't care about decentralization from the beginning, they're entirely comfortable leaving the network in a centralized model. Think about it. Why would they change? Just like Ethereum going from proof of work to proof of stake, they have to put in a difficulty bomb and do all this stuff because they've created a class of people in their ecosystem who they effectively have to fire the transition from proof of work to proof of stake. So why would you, in a rush to get network effect, create a class of people that to do things the right way, you have to fire? And what if they have more power and say at the end of the day than the original founders of the project? That's why you start with low expressiveness and full decentralization, and you systematically ratchet the expressiveness up. You systematically ratchet the performance up while keeping your decentralization. You systematically add new primitives in, like Mithril and these types of things. And then you add pipelining. Then you add 
input endorsers, and you eventually match the performance of all of these people who claim they have it, but then you still have the soul of the project, the centralization, and the people who are patient to build with you. The pioneers, they value the same philosophy as the founders of the system valued. Censorship resistance, decentralization, decentralized control, and they understand it. And the fair weather people, they can still be here, but they don't really have as much of a say. They're living somewhere else in the stack. Okay. So I hope that gives you guys something to think about and something to play around with. You know, it's a long video, about an hour. Uh, but, you know, I, it, it's, it's something that I'm very passionate about. We work really hard here. There's a lot of amazing people at my company and a lot of amazing people at all the companies that are collaborating on Cardano. You look no further than see the Twitter spaces where they talk. Uh, look no further to see the forums, the reddits, all the things. And they wake up every day and they say, we believe in a vision. Not my vision, but a, a human vision, a collective vision about how do we make the world a little bit more fair? And how do we build infrastructure that has principles baked into it? Now, that's batteries not included because nobody's going to help us. The VCs aren't going to help us. The governments aren't going to help us. They make too much money off of the old system. They love the idea and the words, but when it really comes down to it, they have no integrity or soul because at the end of the day, they're held accountable to only one thing. Did we make the wealthy and powerful more money, more power or not? Because that's who they own. That's who owns them. Those are the LPs. And that's who owns the current governments. The whole point of the cryptocurrency industry, at least the one that was started by Bitcoin, not these new things that are coming that are quite disgusting, but the one that started with Bitcoin was saying, let's just restart and do things a little differently instead of don't be evil, can't be evil, instead of probably won't, can't by design. Everybody has the ability to check each other's work. Everybody has inclusive accountability. Everybody has the capacity to be able to verify that things are what they are. That was the dream. That was the hope. And a lot of people signed up for it and they weren't motivated by money. And we know that because there was no money to be made when this industry was started. The science that has been done over the last six years is voluminous. Not just from us, but from everybody collectively. And we have, as a species, as one society, global commons, made enormous progress towards that end of a more egalitarian and fair world where we're all held equally under math. And Cardano is our attempt as a community to try to reflect that, evolve that, and push it along. And there's a little bit of sprinkled magic and scalability and a lot of discussion about interoperability and identity and a lot of work done on governance. I didn't even touch governance at all. And that's another massive, major, enormous component of the puzzle. There's a reason we're number one in GitHub commits. It's not that some person sitting in a warehouse somewhere just randomly clicking a fucking button. It's because there's so many people, so much stuff, so much effort that's going on. And it's a disservice to the entire industry to attempt to compress all of that to a single ego or personality or buzz word or phrase and say, that's that. The work we do is beneficial to everyone. It's patent free, it's open source. And we as a community are solving the hard problems. They're not sexy. They're not something you wake up every day, seeing enormous progress every day. There are setbacks and yes, at times you have to redo things and at times you have to abandon approaches and change them and have the intellectual honesty to know when you're wrong and why you're wrong. And at least that's documented. So people in the future don't make the same mistakes, but that's what being a pioneer and a trailblazer is about. And that is what is going to get us to a better future. That's what people signed up for. And in an, an era of dopamine addiction and, overconsumption of paint chips, maybe those concepts are just hard to understand for some people. That's okay. 
They can come along after we win. But we will, because we have to. Because none of us want to live in a world where we lose. So I hope this video has been educational for you guys and you have a better understanding of things. As I mentioned, lots of blog posts are coming out. A lot of work is happening. A lot of workshops are happening. And I'm very proud of each and every one of the DeFi vendors, people who have come in and they're working hard to get this done. We're going to get it together. Going for number one. Cheers.